rise in support of the Higher Education Support Amendment Bill. Uh, I must say the word freedom gets thrown around a lot, uh, and sometimes uh, I sometimes think it's uh, thrown around without the true meaning of the significance uh, of, of the word and, and, and the impact and how hard it has been uh, for us to uh, get to the freedoms that we have today uh, and the sacrifices that have been made uh, to obtain those freedoms. And of course, for me, when I hear the word freedom, I often go back to that uh, recent movie of recent times, uh, Braveheart, uh, which was so elegantly uh, played by Mel Gibson about uh, William Wallace. And there's a great scene at the end there where uh, William Wallace uh, is basically being executed, uh, and he yells out freedom at the end. Uh, now, there's a lot of criticism about that film, whether it's all uh, correct or not. But what was true was that William Wallace was indeed executed in the name of what he thought was freedom. And I'm just going to read out to you the exact details of his death, because I think it's worth remembering how hard our freedoms have been fought for and how hard um, we need to fight to make sure we strive them. After he was captured, uh, Wallace was transported to London where he was tried for treason and atrocities against civilians in war. Um, he was then crowned with a garland of oak to suggest he was the king of outlaws. He responded to the treason charge, I could not be a traitor to Edward I, for I was never his subject. Following the trial, Wallace was taken from the hall, Westminster Hall is, to the Tower of London, then stripped naked and dragged through the city at the heels of a horse. He was then hung, drawn and quartered strangled by hanging, but released while he was still alive. He was then emasculated, and for those of you who don't know what emasculation is, that's where you have your entire crown jewels removed. He was then eviscerated, where he had his internal bowels removed. His bowels were then burned in front of him, and he was then beheaded. His head was then dipped in tar and placed on a pike atop London Bridge. And it was later joined by the heads of the brothers of John and Simon Fraser, fellow Scottish patriots. His limbs were displayed separately in Newcastle, Berwick, Stirling, and Perth. And a plaque was unveiled uh, in 1956, and it stands in a wall of St Bartholomew's Hospital near the site of Wallace's execution at Smithfield. It includes in Latin the words dicto tibi tibi verum libertas optima rerum nunquam servili sub nexus. Vivato Filet, and in English that translates as, I tell you the truth. Freedom is what is best. Sons never live like slaves. And I think that is an incredibly inspiring story of the sacrifices that people have made throughout history in order to fight for freedom. Now, of course, uh, nine years later, in the year of our Lord 1314, as so eloquently put uh, in the movie, a bloke by the name of Robert the Bruce went out and he won that freedom. And of course, you know, whether or not it's uh, true or not, I'm going to quote it anyway, but as he said before he ran out to battle, you bled with Wallace, so bleed with me. And today, as we put this bill forward, I ask that the people on this side of the chamber bleed like Wallace and fight like Robert the Bruce and make sure that we stand up for academic freedom. Make sure that we stand up for academic freedom. Because without freedom of speech, Without freedom of thought, we are nothing more than slaves. We are nothing more than slaves. And so I'm pleased to uh, promote this bill because it will provide st stronger protections for academic freedom and freedom of speech at our nation's universities, uh, something that seems to be lacking on today's campuses around the nation and indeed the Western world. And I know while this bill only applies to uh, un univers uh, university uh, freedom of speech, uh, I think it's um, something that we should also look at in, in other spheres as well. I mean, I know out there in the digital world of uh, social media, there's a lot of digital lynch mobs out there today that are more than happy to come on and abuse people to the point where they're actually afraid to say what they really think on social media. There's a lot of bullying going there, and in my view, it's just as big a threat uh, to freedom of uh, speech and freedom of thought, as is um, the suppression of free thought at universities. And we should also give a, a big shout out to, of course, Peter Ridd, uh, who has fearlessly uh, stood up for what he believes in, as well as Drew Pavlov. He was uh, kicked out of university 
uh, at the University of Queensland uh, for standing up for what he believed in. And indeed, our own Craig Kelly uh, was kicked off Facebook for standing up for what he believed in. So, you know, we're always up against uh, the command and control tendencies of those who wield the power, and we must always make sure that those who don't wield the power. Well, I'm thinking, well, uh, I'll take that interjection, thanks, Senator McAllister, because at the end of the day, having been in this chamber for almost two years, I actually think the bureaucrats wield a lot more power uh, than the elected. Uh, Members of Parliament do. You've only got to look at the RBA. They have the autonomous control over the monetary policy, our currency. We have an Australian Research Council who, in the law, it says uh, that they are responsible. They have ultimate control over the $3 billion and how that money uh, is granted. Uh, we have the ABC who have no independent review body on how they behave. Uh, so there are plenty of examples whereby the bureau bureaucrats are basically today uh, unaccountable for their actions. So I'm more than happy to stand by my assertion that. Uh, we need to make sure, and, and indeed the universities—I forgot to include the universities in that—that that to make sure that where taxpayer dollars are being spent, uh, the bureaucrats are held to account. Um, and in, in many cases, that means we're going to have to take back the idea of an independent statutory authority, because ultimately, at the end of the day, the bulwark of democracy is accountability and transparency. And whether you like it or not, bureaucrats aren't elected. You mightn't like politicians, but we are elected, and what we do, we are held. Uh, to account for. We are very transparent. We have to stand here in the chamber. We have to stand up, to, uh, stand up in front of the media uh, and in front of our constituents. So uh, it's very, very important that uh, we are held to account um, as well. So anyway, the purpose of the Higher Education Support Amendment Bill is to amend the Higher Education Support Act 2003 to repeal and replace the two references to free intellectual inquiry with references to freedom of speech and academic freedom, and insert a definition of ac academic freedom. This bill gives effect to the recommendations from the 2019 Independent Review into Freedom of Speech in Higher Education, which was undertaken by the Hon. Robert French, former Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia. This bill will provide a new definition of academ academic freedom that enshrines in law principles of freedom of expression that are an essential part of our life at universities for both academic staff and students as, as, as were when we went to university. This definition closely aligns with the definition recommended by the French Review, with a minor technical modification recommended by the University Chancellor's Council developed in consultation with Mr French. This modification excludes one element the freedom of academic staff without constraint imposed by reason of their employment by the university to make a lawful, lawful public comment on any issue in their personal capacities. That was part of the definition originally recommended by Mr French and included in his proposed model code. As part of the consultations on the proposed, de proposed de definition, it has been suggested this element is more about freedom of speech than academic freedom and shouldn't be conflated in a definition of academic freedom. I recall when universities were once the bastion of, of freedom of thought, speech, and once drove political and social discourse. Now, courtesy of cancel culture, the far left, disguised as neo-Puritans, are busy trying to shut down debate under the guise of safe spaces for fear of offending. A survey commissioned in 2019 asked students how they saw the current state of freedom of speech in universities. The survey included students of all political persuasions. 39 per cent of respondents supported the ALP, 28 per cent supported the Greens, 14 per cent supported the Coalition and 20 were other and undecided. The results were concerning, to say the least. 41 per cent of students felt they are sometimes able, unable to express their opinion at university. 31 per cent of students have been made to feel uncomfortable by a university teacher for expressing their opinion. 47 per cent of students feel more comfortable expressing their views on social media than at university. 59 per cent of students believe they are sometimes prevented from voicing their opinions on controversial issues by other students. 82 per cent of students agreed that university students should be exposed to different views even if those views are challenging or offensive. 
86 per cent of green supporting students, 82 per cent of labour supporting students and 82 per cent of coalition supporting students agreed with this statement. In my home state of Queensland, we have had the highly publicised drama involving Drew Pavlov at the University of Queensland. In August last year, the University of New South Wales media team deleted Twitter posts from one of its academics, now adjunct law professor and human rights watch Australia director Elaine Pearson, which drew an online backlash, backlash from foreign students. The University of New South Wales, after receiving a barrage of angry responses from Chinese students and state-owned media, responded with, the, opinion of, the opinions expressed by our academics do not always represent the views of the University of New South Wales. We have a long and valued relationship with Greater China going back 60 years. New South Wales University provides a welcome and inclusive environment and is proud to welcome students from over 100 countries. And do we know what the offending tweet said, Mr President? Quote, now is a pivotal moment to bring attention to the rapidly deteriorating situation in Hong Kong. Fair dinkum. The central and allegedly the most controversial element of the proposed amendments is the introduction of the following definition of academic freedom in the legislation. The freedom of academic staff to teach, discuss and research and to disseminate and publish the results of their research. The freedom of academic staff and students to engage in intellectual inquiry, to express their opinions and beliefs and to contribute to public debate in relation to their subjects of study and research. The freedom of academic staff and students to express their opinions in relation to the higher education provided, provider in which they work or are enrolled. The freedom of academic staff to participate in professional, professional or representative academic bodies. The freedom of students to participate in social societies and associations. And finally, the autonomy of the higher education provider in relation to the choice of academic courses and offerings. The explanatory memorandum includes the following explanation. The statutory definition in item 4 closely aligns with the definition in the French model code but includes a minor technical modification recommended by the university chancellor's councillors. Professor Sally Walker, who is currently undertaking a review of the university sector's implementation of the French code, has advised that this approach is preferable the freedom of academics and students to engage in intellectual inquiry, to express their opinions and to contrib contribute to public debate are deeply connected with the role of an academic and the role of a university, and therefore are key elements of academic freedom. However, this is quite different from an academic making a comment in their personal capacity. Any such comment is not connected with their role as an academic and is more appropriately considered to fit within the ambit of a broader socialist, uh, social freedom of speech. To quote from Brendan O'Neill, a UK columnist who, who himself has felt the wrath of the university, of universities, it is undeniable that we live in a society where a freedom of expression is in crisis. Whether we are being censored by the state, by self-styled guardians of correct thinking, by mobs, or by ourselves. We are being censored, and this matters. It matters because at both the individual level and the social level, freedom of speech is essential to human flourishing. Freedom of speech gives real power to the individual. It liberates us not only to express our own views, which is of course incredibly important, but also to listen to the views of everyone else and to use our mental and moral muscles to decide for ourselves if what they are saying is right or wrong. Freedom of speech is the foundation stone of moral autonomy. It demands that we take ourselves seriously, weigh things up, make moral judgments and correct error as we find it. Censorship, by contrast, destroys us, weakening our, me weakening our mental and moral muscles by inviting us to instead rely on judgments of our superiors on those who will decide on our behalf what we may see, what we may read and what we should think. And if I could just reflect one more moment on those words of Wallace, as he said, they can always take our lives, but they can never take our freedom. 
Mr. Pres uh, Acting Madam Deputy President, I commend the bill to the Senate.